Well, um, welcome. Um, this is actually take two for me, so uh, I was just almost finished when the computer decided to update Windows 8. I already hate Windows 8 enough, but now tonight I hate it even more um, because it absolutely took over control of the computer. I couldn't press pause or anything. So I've just done a three-hour lecture, this lecture actually, and I'm feeling fairly bedraggled and tired. Um, so I'm going to be considerably less enthusiastic than normal, I think. So bear with me. We're going to be talking power and influence in the workplace. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of it happening. But power basically is the capacity of one person or group to influence another person or group. Um, and it depends upon this dependency relationship. Generally speaking, not universally, generally speaking, um, one person's power over another depends on the capacity that one person has to influence behaviour. Um, sorry, it, it depends on the fact that one person has something that the other person doesn't want, and the other person is dependent on that. Now, classically, this is money. So within a workplace, um, you know, he who controls or she who controls the money con controls this dependency relationship to a large degree. Um, however, um, there is this what we call uh, contingent or ca uh, countervailing power. Uh, so classically, you've got this high power versus low power, the boss and the employee, and then you have this what's called countervailing power. Um, in a workplace, the person who controls real power as opposed to supposed power can often, excuse me, be quite a uh, different to what, what appears. Um, the, the textbook refers to how um, CEOs uh, reflect on being quite powerless in circumstances where um, one or two key individuals within an organisation walk out, strike or leave. Um, in my organisation, in the printing operation that I used to run, there were one or two really expert individuals and through their expertise, rather than their knowledge, um, uh, rather than the informational sources, through their expertise, really had the company by the short and curly, so to speak. Um, one or two people there, and they were paid accordingly, should they have resigned, would have caused the company great problems. And so I paid them, uh, if you want, I was dependent on them. Of course, I paid them good money, but I also paid them respect um, because uh, they were critical for the operation of the company and I knew it. So these kind of countervailing powers can become through someone at a lower power level having... Um, information or abilities or resources um, that the people in higher power do not have and need and are dependent on. So that dependency operation works in the opposite direction. I don't think this is going to work today. It was working before, by the way, so very unfortunate. Ah, so power also comes from who you know, and this is a classic statement. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And Hillary Clinton, of course, knew Bill. But Hillary Clinton, as she gained from being just a private citizen married to the president, um, she also gained power as a senator eventually in the state of New York. She was the first lady, of course. She also became secretary of state under Obama and subsequently developed all sorts of very interesting connections. Um, we see here uh, the North Korean president, David Cameron, uh, Angela Merkel, Bill Gates, and perhaps most influentially, I highlighted this one, was Rupert Murdoch, who controls informational power on a grand scale internationally. Uh, so you can see the power of networks to influence your power. Sources of power. Okay, we talked there, we briefly touched on a few like reward power. There's also legitimate power. I'll zoom in on these. So, legitimate power is power based upon law, convention, policy, the written word, or status, that a structural status. So, you know, the Chief Justice of the High Court has maybe a, a wimpy, weak idiot with a poor speaking voice, but he still has. She has power because of her status or his status within the organisation based upon 
whole strata or network of conventions and rules. It's based on agreement and based on job descriptions and mutual agreement. And it often is legitimate power. And uh, this kind of um, power does vary uh, across national organisational cultures, as you can imagine. No real need to talk about uh, reward power. It's kind of obvious reward and punish power. The coercive power, more importantly, relates to the negative side of power. You know, uh, and it can involve force. Um, it can happen upward as well as downward. Um, people can bully upwards, for example, uh, and there's an increasing literature recognising how um, leaders can be bullied by underlings within the organisation. Then there's expert power, which derives from having a knowledge that others need or value. It's particularly true in the new information knowledge economy where we are starting to get the dominance, the nerd power, uh, the dominance of people who know things about computer technology, for example. Referent power is perhaps kind of the sexiest form of it, which is you know, charismatic leadership, the ability to generate liking or respect on the part of others simply through one's force of personality, for example. And oh, such a shame, the missing video. That is a real pain. Now, when we're looking at these structural um, networks within the organisation, we've got these three classic ones. They oversimplify things, of course, but you know, if um, let's take the military. Um, military is a great example. The general, um, the lieutenant general, uh, the lieutenant, and all the way through to the private down at the, uh, the front line. There is a little bit of vertical power as the uh, information flows back up the channel, uh, but more, re more readily orders are delivered down the channel, as we talked a little bit about communications last week. Now, um, in this kind of central wheel type of st uh, situation, that person there is central to the control of power. We'll talk about centrality a little bit later on. Uh, and this is classically found in small businesses where everybody's answerable to the one boss. No matter who you are, six or seven staff members, ten, still one boss, one centre or central control of power. And that this kind of messy all-channel situation. And you'll sometimes see in organisations a combination of these three different formats. Now, power depends on a number of different contingencies or if and but statements. Uh, statements. And my voice is just a little bit huskier than normal because I've been going for hour after hour at this stage. Um, substitutability. Um, imagine if you're the only person in the office, for example, who knows how to fix the photocopy machine. You're the only person. You may be at a relatively low level, but because of the low substitutability of your skill, you hold power with as few alternative resources. Centrality, we talked a little bit about that. It relates to the interdependence between power holders and others. And it's a function of how many others are affected by you, informed by you, how close your networks are, and how central you are to those networks. Discretion. The freedom to exercise your power. I mean, you can have all this power. For example, a CEO uh, sounds powerful on paper, may even have some legitimate power, but that power may be heavily constrained because his wife or her wife, uh, her husband, uh, partner, says that, look, if you do that, I'll divorce you. They may have low discretion. Um, CEOs' may, power may also be constrained by the board of directors or a very powerful set of um, deputy directors who really control the degree to which the information flows through it and have very fixed ideas on how you exercise your power. So there can be low in discretion. Visibility relates to the degree to which obviously you can be seen um, and you know, it can come from being a professor or having a PhD or master's degree, for example, which hopefully you'll gain in visibility as a result of that. Um, the other thing to say about visibility is that um, you know you may have a great uh, as a contingency because you may have a great deal of power, but if you are not connected or not visible within the network, who cares? You know, um, you may have a lot of expertise power, but it doesn't really 
uh, affect you. Sorry for zooming in and out. Um, I sometimes don't know my own slides, but just to, moving on to how you can influence others within an organisation. There's some classic methods here like persuasion. You can use logical, rational, emotional arguments to change other people's opinions. Uh, and that's kind of like a form of referent power. Just quickly on the inoculation effect, which the textbook touches on. And, you know, the persuasion literature, I love it. It's huge. And there's so many different ways in which persuasion can be amplified or reduced. And so, many, so many contingencies. But it refers to the inoculation effect as a particularly interesting little example. So when you're presenting an argument, a persuasive argument to other people, the, the recommendation on the inoculation effect is that you don't just tell them what you what you want to get them or get across. So you don't, let's say, we're going to keep wage rises this year to 3% because of X, and then you'll sell, sell, sell that argument. The inoculation effect suggests that it's better to tell people that, you know, there will be other people who come to you, and they will tell you of these um, reasons why you shouldn't agree to this small wage rise this year. It's about giving both sides of the coin. It's about giving a little bit of the germ of the opposite argument to inoculate people against the power of that argument. So ingratiation consists of things like flattery. You look lovely in that dress, smiling, uh, shaking hands, showing warmth, and making links, doing favours. But doing favours is more a form of exchange uh, power, creating a sense of reciprocity. And that smiling is a form of exchange. Um, impression management is all about shaping public image. And um, um, what, what that means is that, you know, you may be ever so much a liar and a lazy person, but you make sure that every time the boss passes your office, you're typing away, even though it's actually on Facebook, but you're managing the impression you make on those around you. It's a way you influence others. Assertiveness is a way of applying um, leg legitimate or um, coercive power. You can relate to the positive side of reminding, checking, or the negative, confronting and threatening. Um, you know, tall people with big physical presence, great voices, have the ability to be more assertive in this way. Excuse me. Information power, obviously. Controlling information, being a gateway for information within an organisation, whether that's formal information or gossip, um, is a way of, of, of exerting influence. And a classic and effective way for underlings or lower people within an organisation to gain power is by forming coalitions, um, pooling resources of individuals. And you can actually, at a lower level, gain quite a bit of power simply by forming these coalitions and, to some degree, increase your le legitimacy within the organisation. Um, this is a good explanation of why, within some companies, you'll find quite ineffective people holding quite powerful positions sometimes. And that's because they have been politically smart in forming alliances and gaining power through, um, for example, exchange. Uh, you know, I'll, do, I'll rub your back uh, if you rub mine. Uh, I'll watch your back if you watch mine, kind of thing. So these people can gain influence even though they may not really um, justify the position that they hold. Now, um, uh, authority or silent authority is often um, can be influenced just simply through holding a position or role modeling uh, the desired behavior. Uh, and it tends, this kind of authoritative form of influence tends to thrive to a greater degree in high power distance cultures where people do accept the distance between the boss and people below them and where there is a greater power distance and a greater acceptance of that power distance between people at different levels. Countries like Australia, which are, you know, have a very large dialogue about mateship and sense of team, Team Australia, for example, whether it's true or not, uh, in these kind of um, societies, it's much more difficult to exert pure authority, silent authority. So it's obvious that my networks are not going to work today. 
I am, my videos are not going to work. Um, the textbook talks about social networks. Um, it's kind of obvious. There's some great examples there. There was um, an example from Oreos, the biscuit company, um, who used social media networks during the uh, Super Bowl in recent year. Um, the power went out at half time briefly for 10 or 15 minutes, and they tweeted, you can still dunk in the dark. Uh, don't worry about if the power goes out. And they sent out this image. It was remarkable because that image was retweeted 15,000 times and was one of the cheapest and most influential forms um, of uh, advertisement in a in an era when you commonly can pay in the millions for a 30-second spot during the Super Bowl. This was effectively free. Well, not quite, because in fact they had planned ahead on this and spent uh, they had a 15-person social media team working full time through the um, through the Super Bowl period, um, obviously paying massive rates for the for copywriters and even graphic artists and strategists to handle the whole thing, and so they were able to act very responsibly to almost any situation. Now, the thing, the point that needs to be made about um, networking is that you um, uh, networks are a great way to gain in power and there can be formal um, networks of great depth and we'll be talking about strong ties in a minute or there can be very large networks that are very superficial and they both have their advantages. Just uh, quickly looking at consequences and contingencies of power, uh, I just want to really focus on these two kinds of basic groupings of power. Hard power, the power of the gun, the power of threat, the power of muscle, uh, versus soft power, um, where you are using, and it's, it's a softer form, but no less persuasive, uh, and it's based on things like ingratiation, impression management, exchange and persuasion. Diplomacy, for example, is a classic form of soft power, and hard power can be that you know America exerts power through, um, you know, its authority as a, um, a powerful nation, or through forming its coalitions with its NATO partners, uh, or through money, or through threat, its nuclear threat. Now, the responses to power can be, you know, everywhere from what you're desiring, which is a full-scale commitment, which is genuine and longer term, all the way through to resistance, which is really what you don't want. Um, uh, you know, uh, soft power techniques tend to build longer term relationships and commitments, whereas hard, to, hard power techniques often are a little bit like extrinsic rewards. And what, what I mean by that is that, you know, the power of the gun only works well, to a point, as long as the gun exists. But if every gun suddenly were to fail and the people beneath them were to realise that, then the, suddenly the power of the gun would not be there anymore. Whereas if you actually have taken on, if you've been persuaded, you've taken on board um, what their leader is saying and you really believe it, and that power continues on even after the leader is gone, for example. Just uh, talking about contingencies as well, um, it does depend a little bit on power distance. So, you know, the textbook points out quite rightly that in countries like Australia or America, bosses have more to fear from the people beneath them. They can't just hammer the table all the time. Um, a friend of mine from uh, Trinidad was saying that bosses in Trinidad, regardless of whether the companies are successful uh, or unsuccessful, whether the job market is good or bad, have a rather bad attitude towards their staff and hammer the table, yell and scream and use plain old authority to get what they want. Whereas in countries like Australia and America, there's the use of ingratiation, being nice to your staff, is much greater. It's also about status. You know, what, whether you choose, um, you know, a variety of different techniques depends on, on the status or the target of influence. Um, and also, do you have real power behind you or real expert power? Or do you have low, highly unsubstitutable resources? Or do you have right on your side? Do you have rationality on your side? Social capital, which is, you know, the, the capital that you derive from um, cooperation with groups and individuals around you.
Now, there's a, there's a couple of uh, elements of social, of social power that, um, or social networks that um, the textbook talks about. This is not a term I've ever really heard before, but it makes a lot of sense, the degree of betweenness. So, for example, Raphael, let's say this was the factory group and this was the office group, and Raphael has to work between the two groups because of his position as, you know, um, a factory spokesman to the office staff. That gives him a high degree of betweenness. And centrality relates to the degree to which you are the centre of a network, whereas closeness relates to how short path, how efficient paths between you and other people around you. For example, if you're in a office situation, a close office situation, an open office situation, there'll be a high degree of closeness. So those are the three variants of these networks. Social networks offer you a number of things. They offer you information about, you know, inside knowledge of scarce resources or scarce knowledge. They offer you um, visibility. So if you're in a network, um, you know, like LinkedIn, for example, um, one of the reasons that LinkedIn works for people in looking for jobs is that when we start thinking, casting around, you know, I've got a, my sales manager's retired and I really need a new one, we tend to think about the people that we know, the people in our groups. Now, LinkedIn is a very superficial form of group, but it's still better than no group at all. Referent power, we tend to trust those we know, we tend to have faith in those we know, we tend to have faith in those we reciprocate or exchange with. There's this whole issue of strong and weak ties, which is kind of, um, with, with weak ties, you know, like these mere acquaintances, and strong ties are ones where we have multiple level relationships with people so that we you know for example we have strong ties with with friends that may be work friends so we have work related relationships with work friends and we have friendship related uh, relationships with them so you know the strength of ties is often reflected in how close the relationship is how frequently you interact so you know on facebook for example you may have friends who you chat with on facebook every day and often comment on their posts and they comment on yours. So there's a high degree of interaction that reflects the strength of tie and also um, how much resources you share with them and the level of different levels of relationships we have. Now the textbook rightly points out that these weak ties can be quite good because with strong ties, we tend to swim in our own pool. We tend to focus on people who are similar to us and with weak ties, we, we cast the net wider. And this can be very, very good uh, because people outside our comfort zone, outside our pool, have information, resources and connections that we don't have within, within our pool. And so they add to the strength of network when we're facing a novel situation. Um, so certainly when we're looking for a job, for example, um, if you build networks uh, beyond your own network, it will give you more choices when it comes to that moment when you need to find another job. Okay, organisational politics. Um, it tends to be politics is a dirty word in Australia. It's a dirty word in a lot of different countries. And politics tends to be um, one of those uh, terms that we have that uh, refers to cases where power is exchanged for a self, uh, power is enacted for a self-serving uh, point. Uh, that is, not for an organisational reason, but for, um, for something that's good for you, uh, rather than the, you know, an OCB, so to speak, organisational citizen, citizenship behaviour. And I tend to mention these terms time and again because they're the kind of terms, the kind of handy terms when you're coming to, um, as long as you know what they mean, they're kind of handy terms when it comes to the exam. Um, so organisational politics is often a bad thing, or it's considered to be, politics is considered to be a bad thing within organisations. It tends to thrive when there's a shortage of resources, and by that, for example, it could mean, you know, when times are getting tough and bonuses are getting short, and there's competition within the organisation for resources. It tends to happen, tends to thrive when time things are changing, you know, organisational restructures, and also when 
things are ambiguous and uncertain. So clearly, if you want to deal with organisational politics and try and reduce its incidence, one of the things you can do is reduce ambiguity, uh, create a sense of certainty, and reassure people about the allocation of resources that they're going to be equitable. And so you can, by tackling these kind of sources of politics, you can reduce politics within the organisation. And that's it for the week, a, a relatively short lecture, probably not, uh, definitely not my best, um, but uh, hopefully that provides some kind of overview. I hope you are actually spending time reading the text itself and taking notes on the text in preparation for the exam, which is going to happen on the 2nd of February this, uh, this term at 9am. So we're all aiming towards that moment. So good luck and uh, I've been enjoying getting your emails and good, it's good to hear from you regularly. Thanks. Bye.